this word of time, let me welcome each of you who has made it to our seminar. Um, my name is Mosi Kornasol Boy, I'm a fellow at NU, and also a member of the SJC, the Social Justice Coalition. Um, this seminar is entitled The Possibility of Silence, um, which is about um, Abraham Lincoln, the American president, um, who served his presidency from 1861 up to 1865, and Karl Marx was strongly believed in his ideology, which is entitled um, Marxism. So Zaki, today we'll be speaking and revisiting um, the history um, of slavery and in states during the 1800s. And um, leading that to the struggle that we are struggling in South Africa, um, in equality and freedom. So at this point of time, I'm going to give that to Zaki and to speak um, and present his presentation. Thank you. Okay, before I start, um, I just want to thank the people who organized the seminar and the comrades who came in this heat. Uh, it's very hot. <laughs> uh, so say thank you to everyone. Um, because Kosikola and the other comrades. But um, I want to ask people here, who remembers, who can tell me, non-family members, who can tell me when was slavery abolished in South Africa? <coughs> When was slavery? Sorry? Not people I know. Um, so, who, 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 here remember, who, who here can tell me when, when slavery was abolished in South Africa? Yeah. So, I'll just start by telling you a quick short story, um, but I'm going to play you some music first. Yes. Okay, so there's a song that goes, Ta Kumi Alibama. Uh, can, does anybody remember what the Alabama was? So, someone said it. A ship. Uh, that was the Alabama. And the Alabama was a, 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 a ship in the United States that supported the Confederacy, that supported the people who wanted to enslave us. And that song is sung here by people who used to be slaves. Um, and that's, that ship came here to the Cape to be fixed. And it's a very interesting little story because people like me, my great-grandmother was a slave here. And, uh, Yet, slaves here celebrated the ship which supported uh, slavery in the United States and wanted to continue slavery in the United States. So there's a contradiction in that uh, little place where we, we all come from. So the place I want to start tonight is to say, why do we want to talk about something that in time is hundreds of years away from us. Why do we want to talk about something that in space, the United States, is thousands of miles away from us? And for me, the question of the American Civil War, the questions that Abraham Lincoln and Karl Marx posed, their questions about inequality, their questions about democracy, their questions about civil war. Now, for us in South Africa, yesterday we celebrated the fact that Madiba, Nelson Mandela, heard that he was going to be released from prison. And South Africa has managed so far to not have a civil war because of our constitutional dispensation, because our constitutional talks, and because of the compromise that happened we managed to avoid a civil war. 
we were beginning to travel a road to civil war in between 1990 and 19, actually from about 1985 through to 94. We were traveling a road to civil war where the state was funding black people to, to, to kill other black people, in Qatar to kill ANC members, um, Uusa, uh, the Inkata Trade Union to kill Kosatu members. So we were on the way to a civil war. And the constitutional talks stopped that civil war. Or the constitutional outcome stopped that civil war in 1994. But what we have to ask ourselves after Marikana, after the farm workers' strike, after the violence that we see against women and children and black men killing each other in our townships, and particularly if people remember in 2008 when poor working class people here turned against poor working class people from other African countries in xenophobic violence. <clears throat> the question everyone here has to ask themselves is, has South Africa postponed our civil war or have we averted it? Have we simply delayed having a civil war or have we actually managed not to have one? And my belief is that if you look at the way in which workers fought each other at Marikan, the deep inequalities in our society, the fact that clothing workers can earn 60 rand a day today, that deep inequality is a question that links us directly back to the American Civil War. So I want to, I want to discuss the question of slavery very quickly. Um, but before that, I want to say something about Marx and Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was someone who learned to read and write by mm -hmm. studying the Bible. And as soon as he could read and write, he went to a library and he got Shakespeare. And he read all of Shakespeare. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln was a man who never, who spent less than a year in school. And yet he became one of the most successful lawyers in the United States by studying law books in libraries. So he grew up as a child working on a farm for his father. And his father used to rent him out to work for other people on their farms. And he didn't get paid for it. So he knew what it was like not to not to be paid for your labor he knew what that was <clears throat> but he could never imagine what it was like to be a slave he just was horrified by it so one of the things that he then there's Karl Marx who I know there's lots of people here who like him and I like him but he had more education than he needed <laughs> he had too much education, Karl Marx. In fact, he had so much education that he spent 60 years writing, was it 60 years writing one book? <laughs> right? Um, he, he was one of the greatest philosophers of all time. His wife came from the royal royalty, mini royalty in Germany, the von Westphalens. Um, maybe I'm wrong, there's an expert here on the <laughs> Marx family tree. If you read how Marx spoke of Abraham Lincoln, you can see that superiority that people who are educated have very often towards uneducated people, or people who are not formally educated. He said, Lincoln is not the, off Lincoln is not the offspring of the People's Revolution. He's a plebeian who made his way from stone splitter to senator. A man without intellectual brilliance, without special greatness of character, without exceptional importance, an average man of goodwill. Now, Marx was to change his position on Lenin completely, completely, in the course of the Civil War. Marx 
followed the Civil War on a daily basis, more than a daily basis. Sometimes he'd get two, three letters from the United States uh, a day from Germans who were in the United States, from other Marxists who were in the United States and so on. And he discussed the Civil War. In many ways, he knew more about the Civil War than I think most people who were actually doing the fighting did. And that's, that's, that's a very important thing to remember. Now let me talk about what caused this war. The war was caused by slavery. Someone needs to tell me how much time I have. It's 10 plus 6. It's 10 plus 6. And I want to read to you just a few words from a chap called Adam Hochschild's book, Bury the Chains, The Struggle to Abolish the Slave Trade. And if there's one book that everyone here should read in order to be a great activist, it is that book. That book we must study because it's about class solidarity, it's about race solidarity, it's about worker solidarity, it's about the first consumer boycott. And in that book, Adam Hochschild says, picture a world in which the vast majority of people are prisoners. Most have known no other way of life. They are not free to live or go where they want. They plant, cultivate, harvest most of the Earth's major crops. Sorry, I'm going to wait till people come through. These are the latecomers from school, eh? <laughs> they, we should do a latecoming campaign for equal education. Don't you? Yeah. Welcome, guys. So I'm just going to start a little bit back on uh, the question of uh, Adam Hochschild's talking about slavery. We're talking about slavery for people who just came in. Picture a world in which the majority of people are prisoners. Most of them <coughs> have known no other way of life. They are not free to go and live to live or go where they want. They plant, cultivate, and harvest most of the Earth's major crops. They earn no money from their labor. No money from their labor. <coughs> their work often lasts 12 or 14 hours a day. Many are subjected to cruel whippings, carrying some, some even carry chains. Huh? If they did not work, uh, cruel whippings or other punishments if they did not work hard. They die young. They are not chained or bound most of the time, but they are in bondage. Part of a global economy based on forced labor. Such a world would of course be unthinkable today. There are parts of the world where it's not entirely unthinkable. There's small places in the world where children are still slaves. But that's a different discussion. But in the majority of the world today, People are paid when they work. They wage slaves, not slaves. So, I want to then turn to what Marx said about slavery. Marx said about slavery, and this is the important question for me is, that Karl Marx, when he wrote Capital, said much more about the United States Civil War than he said about any other revolution at the time. As socialists, as, as those of us who grew up as Marxists, uh, Dina, Laddie, and other comrades here will be able to tell you, the revolutions we studied was the French Revolution, the revolutions of 1848, the Paris Commune of 1871, we studied uh, the Great Russian Revolution, we studied the uh, Chinese Revolution, the African Liberation Movements, but we never studied what I believe was the most important revolution, and that was the American Civil War against slavery. And what did Marx say about slaves in, his, in, in Capital? He rewrote Capital entirely. His, his thinking about Capital changed 
because of the American Civil War. The American Civil War made him rethink how he was going to write probably the most important book written um, since the Bible uh, was Capital. And it, he, he, the manner in which he thought writes about slavery there is very important to remember. He says, Slavery was the re a reckless sacrifice of black life. The slave owner buys his worker in the same way he buys a horse. He buys his worker in the same way he buys a horse. If he loses his slave, he loses a piece of capital, which he must replace with fresh expenditure at the slave market. So, he didn't condemn it abstractly. He understood what, what it was. He said that a slave was an instrument without a voice. A slave was like a hammer, but a slave had a voice. A hammer doesn't have a voice, and that's how people treat, treated human beings. But the most important thing he said, he and Engel said, is that the way they understood is that Europe had lost its conscience by publicly declaring that the way in which they got wealth from slavery was what, made, uh, was what made them great and they flaunted that wealth that they gained from slavery. Every church, every major church at that time had invest investments that relied on slaves. There's not a church that you can remember, not the Catholic church, not the Anglican church, Except the Quakers. The Quakers were the only people who didn't have slaves. But all the other churches got very rich on slavery. So, Lincoln, his view on slavery, he said the following. The Republicans, now, most of us today, Lincoln's, par Lincoln's party was the Republican party. Link, Abraham Lincoln's party was the Republican Party. Now, today, we know the Republican Party to be what sort of party? A conservative right-wing party that wants to exclude every human being from it. Even themselves, they hate themselves so much. <laughs> Everything that's in their hearts and in themselves, they hate so much that they exclude it from the rest of the world. They want to just exclude it, they want to hate it. But when Abraham Lincoln and other people founded the party, they founded it with the belief that every human being is free and equal. At least the left wing of the Republican Party believed that. The, most of the others believe that is born free and should be sometimes thought of as equal. Not all the time. But the Republican Party, uh, Lincoln said, they inculcate with whatever ability they can that the Negro, which is the word that everyone used to describe a black human being, is a man, that his bondage is cruelly wrong, and that the field of his oppression should not be enlarged. The Democrats deny his manhood, deny or dwarf into insignificance the wrongs of his bondage. So let me tell you two stories of two slaves. The one was a woman called Lydia, and she lived in a place called North Carolina. And North Carolina, um, so for, for people who don't know, the United States was divided between, and still is, between North and South when it comes to politics. The South is where all the slaves lived, and the North is where most people were not, in, the vast majority of people were not enslaved. There were slaves carried into the north as slaves, but mostly the north did not have slavery. Slavery existed in the south. And North Carolina was one of the slave states. And Lydia worked for, was a slave of a woman. But the woman hired her out to another man. So she was rented out to another slave owner. And during that, the slave owner wanted to punish her. And what did he do to her? He started beating her 
and she tried to run away and what did he do? He took a gun and he shot her. So a charge of assault was laid or whatever the charge was against him in a court and a jury of 12 white men found him guilty and said that a slave should be beaten like a child, not, <laughs> not like a uh, like you beat animals. God forbid we should beat our animals at all. But anyway, he, that's 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 what he said. They then appealed this case to the North Carolina Supreme Court, and there a judge said the following. He said, the slave surrenders his will in implicit obedience to that of another. Such obedience is the consequence only of uncontrolled control over the body. There is nothing else which can operate to produce this effect. The power of, of the master must be absolute to surrender the slave perfect. The power of the master must be absolute to, re to render the, the slave perfect. And he said that if a, if a slave owner could not beat a slave, then the slave doesn't, then, then the property, because slaves were regarded as property, then the owner loses control over his property. That's what, that's what the court said a judge of the North Carolina Supreme Court about a woman who was shot. He didn't, when he said uncontrolled control over her body, just think of this, it was a white man, it was a black woman, and we know that most black women then and now face such violence from men. And just think of how slaves were treated. And think of how women slaves were treated. Then we go to Dred Scott. You see there, at the top there, are things that look like stones. Now, Jewish people, when they go to a grave, they put a stone on top of a grave. But those are pennies. And the pennies of that has the face of Abraham Lincoln on it. It's called Lincoln Pennies. And people take it and they put it on top of that grave. Dred Scott was a slave. That's uh, a drawing of or picture of Dred Scott and that's his wife, Harriet. And Dred Scott had lived in a free state for many years as a slave with his wife and his child was born as a free person in Wisconsin which was a free state and he then sued to become free he and his wife in the first jury again 12 white men they set them free they said these people had lived in a free state they have a free child um, they should be free the owner appealed it the new owner appeal that case to eventually appeal it to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court of the United States and this is very important why is this important for us to remember what is the highest court in our country constitutional. the Constitutional Court and courts can make very very serious mistakes about people's lives we're now talking about the oldest democracy and you must remember at this time in America America was the only republic in the world. It was the only place where there was democracy. It was the only place where all men could vote, except black men in the South. But it was the only democratic republic anywhere in the world. And the Constitu their Supreme Court decided that Dred Scott should, rem should remain a slave. And the judge, Tawney, wrote the following. A majority decided, only two people dissented. Nine judges wrote the following. Talking about black people. They had for more than a century been regarded as beings of an inferior order. 
and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which a, black, a white man was bound to respect, and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. He was bought and sold and treated as an ordinary article of merchandise and traffic, wherever a profit could be made by it. The, this opinion was at that time fixed and universal in the civilized portion of the white race. It was regarded as an axiom in morals as well as in politics, which no one thought of disputing or supposed to be open to dispute. Men in every grade and position of society acted upon it. And he said that any black person, whether free or slave in the United States, should never be regarded, never be regarded as free, should never be regarded as a slave, <coughs> uh, as, a, as, as free or as equal. And he said that any black person or their descendants, so sometimes you had slave masters who genuinely married slave women and some who raped women and the descendants of people like me colored and you would find that what he said that both black people born in the United States as well as those who've been slaves and those who had been descended from from them should never be free both in the North and in the South. And that court case of Dred Scott set off a chain for what we're now going to turn to, and that's the Civil War. Time? 25 past. 25 past. I'm going to be 15 minutes more, and then we're going to do questions. Um, so, Harriet, well, let me check if her name was Harriet. Sometimes I get people's names wrong, like you all know that, huh? Is Harriet. Harriet Scott, and especially I get white people's names wrong. <laughs> uh, Harriet Scott. Um, Dred Scott died a slave. Um, he was only free in that period when those 12 white men set him free. But he died a slave, officially. His wife lived 19 years as a free woman because she lived throughout the Civil War. And after the Civil War, she became free. Um, and she saw the decision overturned. And the decision was not overturned by law. The decision was overturned by bullets. The de decision was overturned by 600,000 white men, mainly. 600,000 white men, mainly losing their lives to free black people. And some fought not because they wanted black people to be free. Some fought because they wanted their country united. Probably most did. But in the end, they all realized that their country could not be united. Or in the words of Abraham Lincoln, a country, a house divided against itself, cannot be, cannot stand. He said that a government in the United States can't be half free, a country couldn't be half free and half slave. It had to be one or the other. The Dred Scott case set the United States on a path to civil war. Now, what was the Constitution? So, Abraham Lincoln, this is, is a brilliant human being, was a brilliant human being, and he hunted vampires. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys, who, who of you saw that movie? Now, I know who of you went to see the Abraham Lincoln movie. How many people here saw the Abraham Lincoln movie? That one was boring. You must see Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer. That one is bloody brilliant. That is how a movie should be made. Right? Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer. Now, this bugger decided he was going to stand, uh, they selected him as candidate to be president. Now you must know, because he came from a very poor background, and he was totally self-educated, 
and even people like Karl Marx looked down on him. You could imagine how the rich New Yorkers looked down on him. They really, uh, there's a chap called Ralph Emerson Walden, a writer, and he like said the worst thing about worst things about Abraham Lincoln, because he was poor. He learned to read and write from the Bible. He read Shakespeare, and he taught himself to be a lawyer. And so they had like all these great Europe, uh, uh, Americans from Harvard and Princeton and so on standing against him in the election. And he beat one of them one by one in the primary elections. It was like Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, except he didn't have the Harvard education. <laughs> and, and he beat them exactly like that. And when he got elected, when he got elected, a minority of states decided that they would break away from the United States. They would become independent. And they became known as the Confederacy, the Confederation of American States. Today, if you look at those states, they are also the, still the most conservative states. It's still some of the poorest states. It is still states where black people are considered inferior. They were still the states that Martin Luther King organized against. And Harriet Tubman, no, Harriet Tubman was a slave. She, but um, Rosa Parks and, and, and a whole range of people organized against. And the struggle for racial equality in the United States is far from over. But the I'm going on like a bench now. Now, let me go to the Confederate States. So they decided they're going to have a new constitution. And the new constitution says that people have a right to have slaves. And this is what uh, the, the vice president of their, of their um, new uh, country said. Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite, opposite idea that all men are created. Its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural, normal condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. So, the South, their banner, for breaking away from the United States. Their banner said, black people should be slaves. That's what they went to war with. And Abraham Lincoln said, when he was elected, he said that the question of slavery divides the country. And he says, there are those of, those of the country like him who believe people shouldn't be slaves, and there are others who believe that people should be slaves. And when he won his election, they decided to break away. So what he said is they were a minority who had lost an election and decided to go to war against the majority. So just think of that. Today, across our continent, what happens when people lose elections very often? They go to war against the people who win it. Mm. They break away. It started in Nigeria, in Biafra in 1969. It still exists in part of many parts of our continent. When someone loses an, an election, they take up arms against the people who want it. And this is exactly what the white slave owners did. There were, there were 300,000 people owned slaves. 300,000 people owned slaves in the South. There were 4 million slaves. 4 million. 4 million black people were slaves. And so what happens is this war starts. And Abraham Lincoln says, I'm not going to allow, as president, I, I cannot allow a part of our country to break away because they don't agree with the law of the country or because they've lost an election. And they shot the first bullet of the Civil War at Fort Sumter. 
And what he did is he defended the Union. That is in the first bit of the war. So now the war goes on. And it's really a horrific war. Uh, that's Gettysburg. Gettysburg, that's Gettysburg, yeah. I'm getting to a place called Gettysburg. How many of you here know Rob Peterson? Equal Education's late coming campaign, Tutu. <laughs> Tutu Zo. Um, so, what's his name? Who was I talking about? <laughs> Sorry, who? Peterson. Rob Peterson. <laughs> who here? Yeah, no, Rob Peterson. Lots of you in there. So, one day, Rob Peterson said to me, You have to come to my house. I've got this video that I have to show you, and Jack, and Nathan, I think. And we spent seven hours watching this movie about Gettysburg. And Gettysburg is a place where in one day, in one day, 50,000 American soldiers killed each other. 50,000 50, white Americans mainly killed each other in order to free slaves. 50,000 people died in one day. And Abraham Lincoln had decided to issue a thing called the Emancipation Proclamation. And he was very smart, because he was very smart, a brilliant intellectual and a brilliant lawyer. And what he did is he said that I have executive powers as a president known as war powers. And I don't know what these powers are, but I am going to use them to say that anyone in a slave state that is carrying arms loses their slaves and their slaves are forever uh, are freed. Their slaves are freed. And I will encourage their slaves to join the army to fight against their former masters. 180,000 black soldiers joined and hundreds of thousands of slaves left and followed, they followed the Union armies everywhere. Huh? And where am I now? <laughs> um, so they're going Gettysburg. Gettysburg. We're getting to Gettysburg. And at Gettysburg, Abraham Lincoln makes one of the most important speeches that any president has ever made. You can see the graves and how many people were shot. And that battle turned the war around. So he starts his speech and he says, A new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. This nation under God shall have a new birth to freedom. But anyway, that's at the end. But what he says about how, how the soldiers sacrificed their lives is it's haunting. I want everyone here really to, to, to study that speech. To really study that speech. Because there's not a word in it that he hadn't thought of 10 years before. Because he knew what was going to happen. He really knew what was going to happen. So then, after Gettysburg, and after the Emancipation Proclamation, what happens? He now has to do what Barack Obama does and go for a second round of elections. And meantime, there's like mobilization against him everywhere, even in the north, even in the north, uh, in his own, in the parts of America which is fighting against slavery. The Democrats who are saying, no, we should be.
Karl Marx was the secretary of the First International. First International was the first, um, what do you call it? <laughs> International of Socialist, no, no, that's the end. Um, but, so what does he say? What does uh, old, old Karl Marx say? He says, in this meeting, they banned drinking and uh, smoking of the International. So I, there I had to sit for six hours with interminable speeches um, without any drink <laughs> or being able to smoke. Uh, this was Karl Marx. And he writes this letter to Lincoln which says, Sir, we congratulate the American people upon your re-election by a large majority. If resistance to the slave power was the reserved watchword of your first election, the triumphant war cry of your re-election is death to slavery. He goes on and on. And then he says, the working men of Europe feel sure that as the American War of Independence initiated a new era of ascendancy for the middle class, so the American anti-slavery war will do for the working classes. They consider it an earnest of the epoch to come to, to come that it fell to the lot of Abraham Lincoln, the single-minded son of the working class, to lead his country through the matchless struggle for the rescue of an enchained race and the reconstruction of the social world. Anyway, he goes on and on, and Lincoln writes back, but he doesn't write back directly, he writes back through the ambassador and he says, um, uh, we like your letter, but we're not going to make war. Uh, we, we, we're not going to propagandize, and we rely on your solidarity, and lovely to have your solidarity. Um, now, one of the bad things of the war was that it also encouraged a lot of racism, because people were starting to, you know, losing so many sons and daughters and, and stuff like that, so many white people started falling prey in the North, particularly in New York, to racist agitation by the Democratic Party. And what happened is there were days of riots in which every black person they could find was killed or beaten up in, in New York. And Abraham Lincoln was then invited to come speak to Abraham Lincoln was then in, in, invited to come speak to the New York Working Men's Association, which was a socialist organization in New York. And what he said at that thing is very important for us today, because he spoke about workers' unity and working class unity, and he said, that none are so deeply interested to re resist the present rebellion, that is the, the slave owners, as working people. Let them beware of prejudice, working division, hostility among themselves. The most notable feature of a disturbance in your city last summer was the hanging of some working people by other working people. Just think of Marikana. The hanging of some working people by other, hand, by other working people. And he says, the strongest human bond of human sympathy outside the family should be one uniting all working people of all nations and tongues and kindreds. That's what Abraham Lincoln said about workers' solidarity. That the strongest bond after our brothers and sisters, and I believe after friendship, the strongest bond should be that which unites working people. Not simply in our country, but in countries across the world. Okay, and then I'm going to finish up on saying... So, Marx and, Marx and Engels... Marx and Engels helped organize in, in England major mobilization of working people in Manchester, particularly of women in the cotton factories, women workers, to support 
the slave, the, to support the slaves in their war against slavery, to support the Union, even though you saw the Alabama at the beginning, that ship was rebuilt in a place called Liverpool, which made the most money out of slavery. I know how many, I'm a Liverpool fan. Who else is a Liverpool fan here? <laughs> yes, I see. Uh, Barker? Barcelona? Mm. Mali? <laughs> uh, right? So, um, that ship went to Liverpool to be fixed. And it shot up Union cargo and all sorts of things. And eventually the Union sued. Lincoln's government sued the Liverpool sh sh uh, ship owners. Uh, who relied on slave labor. He sued them and the, the Union got money back for the ships that the Alabama had sunk. And one of the things that is important to remember is that in England, all the wealthy people, vast majority of them, all the lords and ladies, supported the South against the North. And most of the working people supported the North against the South. Most of the working people said, we understand how, sl why slavery is bad. The greatest movement that ever existed against slavery existed in England and throughout Britain. And that consciousness, even though those workers were losing their jobs at the time, because as the, the cotton dried up from, sla from the slave plantations, as the cotton dried up, because of the war. The factories of Manchester could not work. And yet those workers said, we support the soldiers, the workers who are fighting to end slavery. So the lessons we can take from Marx and Lincoln is not simply the fact that here were two such different human beings. And who's there like, it's another equal education person. <laughs> you see, our teachers uh, do, uh, don't, do too, don't do too well. Um, go to the last uh, slide. Now listen to what Marx said at the end. So Abraham Lincoln gets assassinated by someone just after the war ended, the Union wins and Abraham Lincoln gets assassinated. And now Marx writes to the President of the United States and he says, Abraham Lincoln was a man neither to be browbeaten by adversity nor intoxicated by success, inflexibly pressing onto his great goal, never compromising it by haste, slowly maturing his steps, never retracing them, carried away by no surge of popular favor, disheartened by no slackening of the popular pulse, tempering stern acts by the gleams of a kind heart. In one word, one of the rare men who succeed in becoming great without ceasing to be good. So that's, Abraham, that's Karl Marx about Abraham Lincoln. Done. Is there some water here? And this way, I see we have a question there. I have questions. Who will have questions before Rachel? <laughs> She's going to give me a hard time. No, 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 I'm not. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in your view, uh, Zaki, of how well do you think Americans, particularly young Americans in the North and South, know this history uh, today? Uh, I think there's some Americans here. Yeah. How many are there? Put up your hands. They can answer their question. We'll start with you. What's your name? <laughs> No, I'm teasing, yeah. I know. <laughs> Stephanie. How well do we know this history? Yeah. 
Well, I mean, it, I guess it depends on where you're from and what school you go to, like if you go to a good school or not, but like I knew all this stuff. We were taught it pretty early on. Um, but I think if you go to school in the South and if you go to school in the North, you're going to get a pretty different opinion. And I went to a, I'm from a very conservative town in the Northeast, so I think what I was taught was probably slightly skewed <laughs> towards what maybe other people were taught. But. And did you know about Marx and Lincoln? I never knew that connection before you brought it up, so we, I studied both of them separately. And one of the other things that's important to remember about that connection was that the 1848 revolutions produced exiles that went to America. A lot of German exiles in particular, and they helped found the Republican Party. So there was that connection. But I think just like here, how many people know how many of us know today who the, pre the first president of the Siskai was? <laughs> exactly. Uh, I'm going to ask someone with a master's degree from ISHAC. <laughs> who was the first president of the Siskai? No idea, right? So people, we forget our history uh, very quickly. And I think. Abraham Lincoln Vampire Slayer <laughs> and the latest Lincoln movie is going to encourage people to read in that history. And they should. Um, how did it end up coming about that the Republicans became the Conservative Party and the Democrats became the Liberal Party when it seemed to start out the opposite way? The Republican Party, because it had fought the Civil War, became the party that always supported the equality for black people until a particular point in time. And the Republican Party was also the party that first supported uh, schooling for everyone, free health care, all that sort of stuff. That was the, that's the origins of the Republican Party. And then, um, with the rise of the civil rights movement, when the Democrats moved to support because the South was predominantly democratic uh, at that time, completely democratic. So when the Northern Democrats took up support for the civil, civil rights movement, and because it was seen as another Northern imposition, and the, the, the Democrats stayed in power because of North and South, the Republicans, the, the, the Southern Republicans, uh, the Southern Democrats switched their alliance. And they then made the party a party of racism again, and, and, and so on. Um, I have a question. Uh, earlier, you mentioned the fact that um, there's a big, there's a big critique of Lincoln as, uh, as not such a great abolitionist. Yes. And um, I'd just like you to expand on that. I heard Chomsky say some very interesting things. That say he actually argues that. At the outset, uh, there was no interest in uh, trying to free slaves uh, from the Republicans. And the, the argument, I mean, this counter arguments coming, and the people in the South said, look, we, we care for our blacks, you know, we give them housing, you know, we give them a place to work, and we take care of them, they have a pension, and so on, although they're slaves. You don't care for your blacks, you, you know, don't give them a place to live, and so on, and so on. So, um, that was the initial position, and then obviously it changed, and Lincoln took up the abolitionist position through encouragement from Frederick Douglass, and so on and so on. But there is that critique that actually in the beginning Lincoln was not a great abolitionist at all, and was personally quite racist. Uh, but so why why do you why are you so quick to defend him? Yeah. All right. So <laughs> so a lot of people. Yeah. It's my favorite question. Is, is that trigonometry? Okay, I want to know more about this, but that movie you say is a great movie, is a great movie too. And that trigonometry thing about if this is equal to, to that, this, yeah. if this is equal to this, and this is equal to this, then of course they're equal. But, and that's how we want is. So, yeah. So here's a question. In the United States at the time, how many, how many white people do you think were not racist? Two. <laughs> <laughs> how many? Yeah, 
think majority of them are there. I wouldn't say the majority, I would say like 99.999%. Yeah. Isn't that a majority? Right? <laughs> right? That's, not, that's, not a ma that's an overwhelming majority. Right? That's an overwhelming majority. And yet, there was a book, what was the, what was the book that sold the most that was against slavery? Uncle Tom's Cabin. You know we call black people Uncle Tom when they're collaborators. But that book was about a nice Christian slave and which showed that why a nice Christian slave should be a free man. And yet it sold four million copies in the United States and it changed people's views on slavery. Was there one person, how many people in the United States didn't believe in God at that time? <laughs> Two of them, right? Uh, how many people here believe in God? All of us. I think it's, I think it's sort of two thirds of us don't believe, and a third of us believe in this room, yeah. right? Now, the question about that is, the question is that did Abraham Lincoln have racist sentiments? I think he did. Did Abraham Lincoln abhor slavery? Totally. Yes, I believe he did. If you read and study his writings, you see how much he hated slavery. Did he say, I don't believe that blacks and whites should marry? He said, just because I want a black person to be free doesn't mean I want to marry her. Because why? If he had to say that, that stuff, what would have happened in the United States if he said, oh, I simply believe that every black person is free and equal and I want my, my son to marry a black woman. What would have happened? No support. Hey, he, would, he wouldn't have won an election. He wouldn't have won anything. And so I think one of the important things to do is not to place our consciousness today on what existed then but to look at things in order to change, to see what we can use to change. And for me, the most important thing that didn't exist at that time was a movement of black people to free themselves. A big movement of black people. Yes, there was Fred, Frederick D Douglass, the great anti-slavery campaigner, right? Who Lincoln invited to the White House, right? The first black person in the White House on official business was Frederick Douglass and he was invited by Lincoln. So he his understanding was based on his feeling. His actions were based on his feeling and the feeling of the majority of people in the country. He was ahead of them but he tried to take them with him. And at the same time there was no movement of black people. That only came in a real, on a real scale at the, in the early 20th century. And we know that the only people who can free themselves are people who are oppressed. And so I, that's, that's why I'm a Lincoln fan. Um, okay, you kind of, can, sorry, can, can I? Yeah, yeah, pleasure. I kind of answered my question, but I guess what I wanted to know is if, and maybe, it's a very small thing, you know, I hope it's okay if I can read it and then ask you the question, yeah? So this is a quote I have from Poverty of Philosophy, 1847, and this is Marx. He says, without slavery, you have no cotton. Without cotton, you have no modern industry, as you said. It is slavery which gives the colonies their value, it is the colonies which have created the world trade, and it is the world trade that is the precondition for large-scale industry. Thus, slavery is an economic category of the greatest importance, yeah. end quote, yeah? yeah. Um, so now I guess what I was actually trying to ask is that do you think there's a possibility that actually seeing that it was a catcher of the greatest importance and there's no slaves in the north that this was a war fought not so much for moral reasons but for economic imperatives? Yeah. Uh, it, was, it was all of it. It was all of it. But there were lots of people in the north, uh, lots of companies in the north and so on who were relying on slaves on slave labor, who were invested in slaves. So it's not as if the, the North wanted to take over the South, right? There, there were many different reasons. Economic ones were some of them, right? 
but the north was much richer than the south. Much, much richer. The, so the north didn't have to, the north didn't need the south. The north was much richer than the, than the south. Come on, guys. Did they need the... Is it the bottom? No, no, no. Did, they, did the north need the free slaves to come, to, be, to move up north and become wage laborers? Did they have a shortage of labor? Did they need them? Uh, well, there was always a, uh, a tension between the need for labor in the United States and the fact that people could just move, move west and move into different land. But what you had is you had massive immigration from Europe. So you didn't need you didn't need free slaves. Free slaves, and in fact, most Northerners didn't want the blacks to come to the to, and especially the workers because it would be competition. And it's exactly the the reason that the Southern white poor working class fought to maintain slavery is because the only thing between you and a black person is the fact that that person is being held down. If that person becomes your equal, then you you have to compete. So. No, no. They didn't want. They didn't want black people in the north. Okay. Sorry, they could have their freedom down there. There's <laughs> <laughs> a question from Colin. Uh, did Zaki answer his question about having uh, us having only postponed our civil war? <laughs> what do you guys think? Have we postponed our civil war, or have we averted our own civil war? Huh? I'd say it's Why? I feel like there's too much tension in the country still. So it's gotta it's gotta yeah, it's gotta boil over at some point. I, I just it could be hundred years from now, but it'll probably be when the ANC moves from the election and a few years after that, I would say. Not to be negative, but I think. Yeah, I'll go on to say we, it is, it's been postponed. Um, an example of the couple of years back, we had the story of the Buramach. You know, so that plan didn't work. So I think somewhere along the line, it's still something that might still happen. So I would say it's, we postponed it for now. It's war of people in the same country <laughs> against right? But I don't believe that the Africana right is a threat. I don't believe they're a threat at all. They're a tiny threat. They're like a tiny threat. They kill themselves. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's some other forces that are very real threats. <laughs> It's inequality. Yeah. It's inequality. That is the that is the threat. And it's for me the biggest danger and, and what may cause a civil war is poor people fighting against poor people for small resources. Mm -hmm. Who here lives lives in Langa or Googs? Googs. <laughs> right? Now if you live in Langa or Googs and you were born there, what do you think of people living in Kailecha? Huh? People coming from the Eastern Cape. Borners and? Yeah. Borners and? Borners and refugees. Yeah. New newcomers. 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 Uh, refugees. <laughs> and that is, that is, that is black people against black people. Huh? That's black people against black people. What do colored people who live in Manchester and in Hanover Park, and in Lentegeer, think of African kids coming to their schools. Their schools. What do they think? Yeah. And so the competition 
the war that is beginning, that it's possible, is not between white and black. White people and middle class people and upper class people will be the last people affected by the Soviet Union. They have private security and they have the best police. The people who are going to fight each other are the miners of Maritana, the workers who want to work on the farms and the workers who want to strike on the farms. Right? The colored people who have been on waiting lists for houses in the province for 40 years against the people coming from the Eastern Cape and who have been here 10 years without a house. That's, that's where the fault lines is for a civil war. And so, for me, what I, I think we can avert the civil war. I really believe we can avert the civil war. Who believes also that we can avert it? Why X? Can you worry? I think that we as a, as a democratic country first, um, we've got. Can we give him a mic? I think there are too many white people in the room, he's scared to talk to them. <laughs> okay, well, I believe that um, A is as a democratic country and with what is um, happening currently um, with um, what we've been hearing about with um, the opposition parties that are against the ANC, um, Mampela Rampela's um, party, or if she's going to start a party. I think everyone um, has a chance, um, and I believe that with the organizations that we are working with and are working for, um, we can um, avert that. Um, I think that, for example, an organization, the organizations that are working, I, 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 speak, I always speak about Kaidicha because I'm from there and I work there. Um, the organizations that are working in Kaidicha, the work that they do there for the years that they've worked, they've um, averted a lot of conflict between the communities that are there um, with there's there've been there have been developments in areas that are in Kailicha. There have been there are people who got houses before people who were there before. But with organizations such as tech, such as the SJC and Equal Education, and with people who believe like me that we can make change, um, I believe that we, we, we can. And I think that it's not only up to us as people who are in Kailicha. I think as, as much as we involve middle class people in the struggles that we are fighting for, um, I believe we can yeah, do that. Okay. Let me tell you, let me tell you also why I agree with Max. There is a danger. I think we have five, seven years, perhaps, not five, ten, or fifty, but I think we have five or seven years to build a generation of young people to ensure that organizations like Equal Education become much stronger, that the SJC gets one or two branches outside of Kailija, and perhaps outside of the Western Cape that we link up with other organizations in other parts of the country, the country. that we ensure that TAC is strong. 
uh, because we need a health service, <coughs> right? Now, you imagine people that are now on treatment would be dead, yes. would be dead, including me, right? But because we existed, and because every time there's a stock out today in a clinic, you can call up TAC and they'll try to do something about it. It shows that people can hold government accountable. It shows that people can hold government accountable. Just as when TAC wouldn't have been able to help government if we didn't succeed in overcoming the drug companies. Because in the end, the reason people didn't have medicines, couldn't afford medicines, is because of enormous class inequality, of wage slavery, and having no jobs. So, young people like you have to be able to understand how we need to rebuild our government, our democratic institutions. Not because we like democratic institutions, we like them, yes. But Mampela Rampela only likes them because she's the president of the chairperson of Goldfields. She just likes them for being democratic. What we want them from is to make sure that Goldfields shares its wealth. That's why we want a, 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 a democratic our government to be able to work. <laughs> and cleaning up our water and so on. But at the other hand, we need a second revolution. We need a second revolution. To avert the civil war, there's only one thing that can avert it. And that is a mass revolution that is peaceful and democratic and allows young people who are the vast majority of South Africa to say to politicians this is what we want and this is how we're going to run the country. So I think we can avert our civil war if we build independent organizations, if we understand that we need young people like you in Parliament, if we understand that those of you who do go to Parliament for to struggle for equality and justice, those of you who do that don't go there to sit there and be nice, or even to fight there. You use it as a platform to organize, to support organizations like Equal Education, like TAC, like SJC, like Open Charter Street, like Section 27. You use it to support organizations, not to make yourself rich, and not to make yourself famous, but you use it to build you use it to build. And so I, what I want to say to you guys is we can avert it. But it's going to require young people like you to go to parliament to organize for a second revolution. And one that is peaceful. You can never guarantee peace in anything. People do die when they go on peaceful demonstration. We've seen it, see it in Syria. We see it in across the world, even in the United States, you see it. So, but we need, you guys need to get your act together. <coughs> and I think one, one good example today in our partners meeting, Ushawa might have averted um, <laughs> a little the civil war, because we were talking about most of the people from our partners were saying that they, they are tired of um, portable toilets, portable toilets. And there was a guy from a certain political, youth political league. Fancy youth league. Just say it. Just say it. From the AMC youth league who said that if Let's go ban them. we're going to ban them, and the shower, my comrade here next to me said, no comrades, that's. That's not the way to go. If we want them, let's protest um, um, not violently and let's draw up a petition and let's 
to go to the city and say we don't want that. Let's so. carry the toilets and put it outside Patricia's door. <laughs> <laughs> We have, to be, we have to be militant. We have to be militant, but militancy doesn't mean violence. If you guys don't become militant, then you're failing us. You have to become militant. You don't have to become violent. I, I, I almost forgot how to it. <laughs> While I've got the mic, I'll use it. Um, Do you think there's a do you think there's a danger of us coming to that point? Okay, first let me let me give you a little preamble. Um, I read something by Moritz and Beggy some time, long time ago, and maybe this is where you get to five to seven years. He says in twenty in a few five to seven years, uh, our fiscus is going to shrink, i.e., the, the money that we get through SARS, the government that, that they have, because demand for natural resources is going to plummet from all times high to low, and that's where government gets its money, right? Basically for mining and so on and so on. And when the government runs out of money to pay social grants and all this stuff, people are going to get more hungry and so on. Um, now, I'm a little bit cynical and maybe, I don't know, middle class or something, but I have a, I almost seem to think that's the only time where all this room will be, will be too small to draw this kind of talk. Because when people are really hungry and there's no social grants, and that's when people are really going to stand up. What did you stand on that? And what do we do then when there's a real question of power? And now we're confronted. Mm -hmm. Half of Kailicha is in town, 500,000 people. And we're saying, OK, and what does, do we have an Egypt situation uh, where oh. we talk, 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 but we don't know what we're talking about, we don't know what we want? Which, how do you? Which is the country in which, people, the, uh, which has the most hungry people in the world? Somalia. The most, I'm not talking the most, not the most, not the most hungry. <laughs> 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 the most hungry. America. <laughs> India. India. The hunger is not a guarantee of militancy. Hunger is a guarantee of trying to struggle against someone else who has something. And it can be your neighbor or it can be a capitalist. Right? And you don't get to the capitalist unless you organize and you think and you reflect and you learn. And that's what you do. And that's what you all do. Right? So desperation is no guarantee of revolution. So Look, is it the problem when, when your neighbor is a capitalist and then probably if he's a good capitalist, has lots of money, that's when you get your militancy becomes violent. Like South Africa, the, the inequality is a big problem. And that's, that's why there's yeah. Inequality is a major driver of violence between people. And, and the, so what I think is, is, is necessary to get the groups of people together. I think the people in this room are, are, are understand what needs to be done. But I think there are lots of people who want to do something. There are lots of people. How many people do you know who are happy with the, the way the country is going? Very few. How many of you know are happy with the way the world is going? We're not happy. People in the United States today, people of your generation, stand less of a chance of having a decent job than many people in this room. Because the economy is collapsing. It rests on paper. Actually, not even on paper. They don't have enough paper to print. <laughs> there that. Right? The same with Europe. You, you, if, you, if you're just in the city here, you'll find so many people, young people from Spain. Why? What does South Africa have in common with Spain? No, no, nothing. Absolutely nothing. They have nothing in common with Spaniards. Fish and oranges. Maybe some and some wine. Yeah. And, and beaches, right? That's, that's all that they have, but they're coming here because they're looking for work. Now, here's a question. We have a very stupid approach to immigration. Very stupid approach to immigration. If we allowed any Pakistani teacher who wanted to come and teach maths or science to our schools, 
what would happen? We'd have the best maths and science teachers. How many maths and science teachers are we short in the country? Tens of thousands. Tens of thousands of short teachers of maths and science teachers. But if we open, not that that one Pakistan is to come, but it can be anyone. It can be anyone, right? It can be anyone. Um, so the question is, similar with doctors and nurses. Our doctors and nurses go away. Other countries, doctors and nurses, whether from Germany or so on, want to come here. What do we do? We say, no, they can't come. That's so stupid. Right? Mozambique and Angola are the two... Angola has more than enough oil, more than enough gas, more than enough hydropower to make sure that we never... the whole continent doesn't need to import oil from the Middle East. That's Angola alone. Mozambique has enough gas to make sure that our countries can run for decades without importing a single cent on energy. But what does South Africa want to do? We want to build nuclear power stations. Right? So the question is, how many of you here are friends on Facebook with another kid in another African country? From another African country. Yeah. Your friends with who are here or in 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 how many of you have friends in Zimbabwe who are in Zimbabwe now? And, but I bet you if you asked your friends, how many of them would have friends elsewhere? In other countries? Not very many. And the point is we have to ensure that our middle classes and our working classes, but particularly our youth who are working class, unify with youth across the continent. We have to, because that's the way we're going to integrate. We could abolish unemployment tomorrow in South Africa if the border was open and our workers went to settle in Democratic Republic of Congo and in Angola. We could abolish unemployment tomorrow. But what do we do? We think everyone wants to come here and we need to be nasty to immigrants. No. So, think about it. I'm talking too much. No. Yes. <laughs> Isaac, are you hungry? <laughs> I am. <laughs> Rachel. Yeah. <laughs> and the last two questions, if there are. Yes, you can. The majority of American men in prison are black, <coughs> yet black people constitute a small proportion of American society. The con consequences of slavery will be with the continent for a long time, and it will be in the United States for a long time. And I think that the campaign for reparations is is something that appeals to people emotionally but really does not address the question because the real question is inequality 
The real question is the money that corporations have and keeping away not simply from African Americans, but from every person in America and every person in the world. So our job is when it comes to dealing with slavery and <coughs> economic and class inequality, globally, we cannot survive unless we regulate corporate power, unless we have laws against corporations that poison the environment. You know, in South Africa, one of the biggest problems that we're going to face is the way our water has been poisoned by the mining industry. That's the biggest problem we're going to face. No one's talking about it. But there has to be, so if we regulate to keep our water clean, what happens? What does the mining industry do? They go to Brazil or Angola where there's no rules. So our job is to ensure that there are rules everywhere so that we don't eat horse meat in one country and real meat in another country. Right? So either everyone eats horse meat or everyone becomes a vegetarian. Um, sorry, so to, so, to, so to come back to the question is, in terms of corporations, we have to, to regulate corporations globally to, minima, to, to get rid of the effects of slavery. But that has to be on the environment, on consumer protection, on above all decent wages, decent working conditions, and a range of other fair trade and fair investment practices. And unless we do that, unless you guys study about what, how we're going to do that and get it right, then we might just as well bugger off and campaign for a little money for a few African Americans to get very rich um, through slavery reparations. Um, because that's all that will happen. It won't go to the mass of African Americans. It will go to those with connections. 